And uh, thank you very much, Rasmus, and thank you for the invite to, to speak and for putting on such a great conference. I'm actually going to talk about three things. So firstly, the survey, but also the background to where the survey came from, because it, it was commissioned by the RAP Product Research Forum work of the product. They have a specific product guidance working group. Um, so I want to explain about that a bit, because it's got some very specific objectives and some challenging objectives. And also to speak very briefly about a joint initiative we're undertaking to develop sector guidance for pharmaceutical and medical devices products. Uh, so firstly, the RAP Product Research Forum. The so RAP, I should explain, is a UK government funded body that's, whose primary um, remit is around um, waste prevention, waste and resources, um, but also with a, with a remit around product optimization. And a key, one of their key programs that they're running is the Product Research Forum, also potentially to be called the Product Sustainability Forum. Um, I think that's, that's where it's, it's going, but currently termed Product Research Forum. It's, it's, as it says here, a collaborative forum to quantify, reduce, and communicate the life cycle environmental impacts of everyday products. And the key terms are collaborative, um, currently involving around 80 organisations, including uh, major UK retailers, manufacturers, um, NGOs, governments, academia, and there's lots of bilateral discussions ongoing with many of the initiatives um, that have been mentioned here today, and they're also hopefully hoping to establish a, a, a multilateral round table. Hope, um, I think on the table there is discussion around um, um, holding that later this year, so no doubt you'll hear more about that. Um, Quantifiable, it's very much focused on hotspots, so looking at priority product categories at the main impacts and hotspots in, that occur within these product categories and the main reduction opportunities and interventions. Um, it's focused on providing practical advice to companies around these hotspots um, and interventions. Taking a life cycle approach, looking wider than greenhouse gas impacts also to material use, waste, water and energy criteria, also with a watching brief on biodiversity and others as they emerge. And at the moment focused on grocery and home improvement products, but again a watching brief there as well. Um, I wanted to just talk about guidance in the context of how the Product Research Forum talk is, is looking at guidance. It has some very specific and uh, specific objectives, and so the guidance needs to be tailored to meet those objectives. And we've heard lots about um, the different methods and approaches out there and on, on kind of trying to make sense of those in terms of uh, their purpose, the objectives, and so the guidance that needs to support those objectives. The objectives here are very much not about product comparisons. It's about actually bringing all products forward that step and making all products more environmentally uh, friendly, as opposed to comparing product A and product B. And the guidance that's, that's intended to be developed through the product guidance working group. There's a few working groups. There's a communications working group, an intervention working group, and I'm supporting or have been supporting the product guidance working group. Um, and I should also mention that the chair of the product guidance working group, Alice Bav Bav Bavistock, is also uh, in the audience. I don't know if you want to make yourself uh, so Alice is also would also be on hand for any questions afterwards as well. She's she's chairing and we're supporting at the moment, and there's many parties involved in this process. And so we're trying to develop guidance. Well, we've developed a template for guidance, which I'll talk about later. Has been a really useful process to really structure what it is we're trying to guide. Um, and this template has got currently five sections, one which is just background information on the, on the product research forum, uh, and also about which products are covered by that specific piece of guidance. 
one section which gathers all the existing information on the environmental impact hotspots for that type of product and also on key reduction opportunities for that type of product. Another section focusing very much on those hotspot areas. So for that product, these are the generally recognised hotspot areas. Practical advice for companies wanting to look at their own products and quantify impacts in these areas for their products and then to monitor those going forwards. So taking that kind of big life cycle challenge and breaking it down into chunks and focusing on key aspects and key hotspot areas. The, the, the fourth piece there is this kind of more akin to a PCR style guidance and the intention would be to, to build, to use existing uh, guidance from existing PCRs and not to try and reinvent those, so where they exist to build this into the guidance and where they don't exist to help the international community by developing PCRs through a consultative process. And the, the fifth piece is around communication and setting requirements for communication in different contexts. So be it internally around hotspots, be internally around full life cycle, be it externally around either of those options. So it's trying to do a lot of things. Uh, there's a template that sets some common text and then developers of guidance would be given instructions on how to fill it in for a particular type of product category. So it's, it's an approach. Um, we've used this approach so far and tweaked it by uh, developing guide, these guidance examples for four different types of products, beer, bread, toilet tissue and TVs. I'm not going to talk about those in details, but they've given us some, some really um, useful steer in terms of how we might uh, improve the guidance going forward or the guidance template and take this process forward. So finally, the survey. Um, the objective of the survey is, is what I particularly wanted to get across. We wanted to do a, a, a gaps analysis. So wrap through the method working group, identified a series of priority product categories and groups, and I'll show these on later slides. Um, we then wanted to understand what existing guidance there was for these. So we, um, and also, where, they, where that could be adapted or adopted within the guidance document um, or when new and specific guidance needed to be developed. So we looked to um, a range of types of different scheme because, because the RAP guidance is so broad in scope. So we looked to the type 3 EPD schemes and PCRs that have been developed through those. We looked to product carbon footprint and other initiatives and schemes that either have led or will lead to the development of supplementary requirements or product rules or sector guidance. And we also look to type one eco-labeling schemes for where um, product guidance, oh sorry, where eco-label criteria have been developed for the, for the product of products of interest because that's particularly useful to inform the hotspot piece as well. So that was relevant. Um, actually, probably some good, um, hopefully, good alignment with the next speaker as well here because, because in undertaking that review, we've developed a, a library that will be publicly available, cataloguing all of the re documents that we've reviewed and looked at. There's about 150 in there, and it contains summary information on each of, um, each of these guidance related documents. Um, we also undertook a review process to consider, to try and capture a snapshot of what, what, they're, what they contain, what they're targeted at, so in terms of the scope of assessment they cover, which impact categories, which life cycle stages, do they contain hotspot related information, eco-label criteria, do they address full life cycle quantification? And if so, do they uh, provide functional unit, system boundary, allocation rules, data requirements? So a summary of all the relevant, do they provide communication requirements and verification needs? So just kind of a, a snapshot of relevant pieces of information 
that are, that meet the kind of objectives and the scope of the RAP guidance documents. Um, so hopefully there, there is some overlap there with the, the registry that's that's been developed elsewhere and, and that can kind of serve a useful purpose. Um, a word on, I did forget to say actually in the last slide, the way that um, the classification scheme that's been used to categorise these, these guidance documents and actually that's been quite a challenge and we spent quite a lot of time trying to get all the various different types of document into one centralised classification scheme and the, the, RAP, the RAP product research forums using the global product classification system mm -hmm. and the guidance and the intervention strategies and all of the supporting practical advice is aimed at the BRIC level so I wasn't necessarily uh, I wasn't aware of the term brick level, but in, in this context, so I've got an example there for laundry detergents. Segment being cleaning hygiene products, family being cleaning products, class being laundry, and brick being laundry detergent. So it's a kind of a gr product group level, um, and um, most other guidance documents either will be. Um, organise or categorise a higher level necessarily because that might be the most appropriate level or using a different uh, product classification scheme. So that was a challenge. Uh, some findings in terms of range, these are the priority product areas that have been identified by RAP uh, in grocery and home improvement. Um, they, there is, there's lots of work being done behind these specific categories and I don't have time to, to talk about that now. Um, I probably could have grouped these a little bit better but a couple of ob observations in terms of um, in the second column is the number of documents that we've identified and in some areas there is a proliferation and those that proliferation is mainly around raw materials, commodity materials and in other areas there's no guidance documents whatsoever and there's kind of broadly around the processed products in the, in the grocery category I'm talking about now. Um, and that we, we might expect because you do need guidance on the, the building blocks, the raw materials before we can move on to the processed products and it kind of reflects where we are in the footprinting world. Um, there's also, I uh, just wanted to note that there's a lot of guidance at the kind of family and class level, um, but less so at the brick level, so less at the, at the product level that we specifically identified for these categories. Um, and that's a, that's a challenge for some. So like meat, you do really need to be getting specific, for example, but fruit and veg maybe, maybe less so if you can, if you can group things. Um, in home improvement, I'll just notice there is proliferation, um, but a lot of that actually is at the product-specific level, and a lot of that was around eco-label criteria, um, particularly for uh, lots of appliances, and there's also um, lots of cleaning chemicals and detergents and audiovisual equipment. I'm a little bit short on time, so I'm just rattling through this, and I do appreciate this has been a bit of a whistle-stop tour, so um, I will take any questions afterwards, and please do contact me afterwards, and there's on the, on the RAP website, there's lots more information about the Product Research Forum, um, but just from find some key findings and observations from my process going through this. Um, obviously, some areas are well covered and others are less so, as, as we might expect, and that's been part of a, a journey. Um, there has been some com conflicting uh, PCRs where there's proliferation in some particular some areas. I don't see that as necessarily insurmountable, and we're already seeing some discussions, for example, for milk, the International da Dairy Federation and Dairy Co. talking to try and align a bit more on some of the requirements. Um, but fundamentally, the um, kind of the basis and the, the, the drivers will, will, will affect some of the detail in the PCRs, but the, the, the underlying methods are still relatively aligned. Um, we found the template approach 
very useful for rapid drafting and also for setting the tone and the level of detail required because I really do feel that you, you need to address your audience and, and we've seen a lot of examples of PCLs that just possibly won't lead to necessarily comparability because they are um, just not detailed enough or not really kind of talking to their audience quite enough in terms of level of uh, 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 specific requirements or detail. And I should note that while we've gone ahead and developed some example guidance documents, the consultation element is um, massively important in terms of adoption and, and there will be a process to do so as part of the product research forum as that goes forward. And I've run out of time for the sector stuff, uh, the pharmaceutical stuff, but just to say this is ongoing. We're looking for stakeholder consultation. Um, it's been led by industry and by the NHS and um, it's sector guidance rather than product rules because that's where they feel they are in terms of being able to do that and being able to compare products. They don't think they're there yet. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna have to cut that.